Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening since we have a global audience today. My name is Rebecca Martin, and I'm a business development manager here at Real Story Group. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm really excited about today's topic because whether you're in the middle of a technology procurement or you're planning for one, I'm confident that this will be a valuable use of your time. You're going to leave here with a deeper perspective on the critical components of a vendor selection process and I'd say more importantly, mistakes to avoid. Nobody wants to kill a technology project before it even starts. So Jerry Jingris, uh, an analyst and our managing director here at Real Story Group, is going to lead you through our discussion today. So Jared, at this point, I will turn it over to you. And thank you, Re Rebecca, for that, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate it. So as Rebecca said, we're going to talk today about the five mistakes that can kill a technology project before it starts. Um, I know many of you have been involved with technology projects uh, throughout your careers, as, as have I. And there's nothing worse than seeing a technology project fail. And if you believe some of the statistics that are out there, some say as many as 70 to 75 percent of technology projects fail. But in my opinion, it, it's, there's nothing worse than having these things go off the rails or never have a chance even before they start. So let's talk about some of the, some of the real key things that you want to avoid uh, when embarking on a technology project of your own. So I know there are a lot of uh, Real Story Group sub subscribers on the phone, and, and again, thank you for joining us today. But for those of you who are new to Real Story Group, just a quick overview. You know, we're fundamentally a, an analyst firm, and we produce research as to uh, what vendors and their products are good at and what they're not so good at, so that buyers of technology can make really smart technology decisions. Um, so people subscribe to our research on an ongoing basis to stay abreast of the marketplace or use us to really uh, help us help you come up with a, a short list of vendors uh, that you should be doing your due diligence on. In addition to that, we uh, advise and mentor a number of uh, technology selection teams. Um, so we, we come in and, and help play matchmaker uh, for you and, and really understand what, what is unique about your situation and match you up with the vendors that are potentially the best fit. And finally, the third third piece in our in our offering is we help a number of our clients benchmark where you are today and really assess how effective you are in a variety of different areas and then benchmark those results against your peers in your industry and cross industry. Our focus area is um, is one that really falls into two main categories across seven different marketplaces. So the marketplaces that you see here, if I were to bucket them into two groups, they really fall into one category being digital workplace technology or um, technology that's designed for behind the firewall in your enterprise, you know, things like enterprise collaboration and social software, enterprise content management, document management, cloud file sharing, that kind of thing. Um, and then the other bucket is more of a digital marketing technology focus, which is obviously uh, content-based technologies that are designed to deliver that content to the right person at the right time outside of the firewall. Um, you know, in, in, I categorize web content and experience management, digital asset and media asset management, and finally marketing automation and our social uh, technology offerings is really falling into that, into that bucket. So without further ado, let's jump into the five mistakes. So mistake number one. Shortlisting the wrong vendors. You know, we see this time and time again where uh, people are embarking on selection projects and they just have the wrong vendors at the table right from the outset. And I don't mean to be disparaging there and, and blame and put a lot of blame on, on, on buyers for putting the wrong vendors on their shortlist because it is just a really confusing marketplace. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to, to check this out from our friend Scott Brinker at, at chiefmartech.com, but this is a, a fun little graphic that he, he does on an ongoing basis, and this is the marketing technology landscape as he sees it, and I think that he, the most recent version of this had some 4,000 vendors on it, and uh, we just think that this is a really unwieldy amount of, of vendors for, for anyone to make sense out of. Um, and so for buyers, as, as they start to think about which vendors they should be considering and do their due diligence on, it's really tough to, 
to pick the ones uh, that are right for you. Um, and combine that with vendor uh, salespeople and, and their marketing arms that are saying that they're good at everything. And that's just really not the case. So what we as analysts aim to do on a, on a, on a daily basis is to try to make some sense of that marketplace for you. Um, to that end, we at Real Story Group, we cover about one, over, a little over 150 products from about 120 or so vendors out there. Um, these 150 products we think are the most significant in the marketplace today uh, based on what we see our clients and others that we work with um, actually using in, in, in the wild, in, in real life. So um, we're, we're seeing, we're monitoring about, uh, like I said, 150 different products and really critiquing them on where, where they're a good fit and where they're not such a good fit. But from there, I challenge all of you on the phone to make the first discriminate, discriminating point when it comes to coming down to, with your own shortlist as to understanding which vendors were fundamentally built for what it, what it is you're trying to do. So in all of our evaluations, we rank the different vendors on their suitability to some canonical use cases or scenarios, if you will. If you know what you're trying to do, then you can, you can match yourself up with the vendors for it that have strengths in those areas. So what I'm showing on the screen right now is an example from our enterprise collaboration research where we identified 10, of, 10 different applications or scenarios that we think these types of software fundamentally try to uh, address. Now, I think you'll notice that not one vendor addresses all of these different, um, different scenarios in a meaningful way. But what you want to do is really ask yourself, what are we trying to do as an organization? You know, there's a real difference between trying to execute on a knowledge-based management system versus a social Q&A um, type system. And so, we, we challenge you to figure out what it is you're trying to do, and again, find find the vendors that really have strengths in those areas, um, and, and proceed with those on your short list. And from there, you can really get into the and do your due diligence and test them out um, from there. We've actually built a, a tool that that we use with our clients, and it's 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 free to try on our website. And I and I, I invite you all to try it out yourselves, but. We have a, a tool that we call the shortlist generator, which aims again to, to match you up with, with the scenarios that are most important to you. So this is an example from our, our DAM research, our digital asset management research, where we have you identify which scenarios are most important to you. And we ask you another a couple other questions that are, are really important discriminating uh, type factors. And from there, we're able to give you a shortlist. But again, the most important factor is how well does this do these products match up with my scenarios? And once you do that, you, you can be sure that you're you're actually looking at uh, the, the vendors that you should be and not the not wasting your time with, with others that are pretending to be good fits for your area. Mistake number two is canned demonstrations. Now, in my role as a as a consultant and analyst, you know, I, I have the privilege to sit in on a number of demo weeks, as we call them, where Vendors come in and show their wares to potential uh, potential buying clients, and they, if you if you've ever done this, you know that you they really can take one or two different turns. First, likely scenario is it's it can be a real snooze fest, and I, I, I if you've ever seen a demo, um, you, I'm sure you've seen some of these that go this way, or alternatively, they can be a real cheerleading session where you know the, the vendors come in and really blow away the, the the client team and everyone leaves really excited as this is the this is the solution to to solve all our problems in reality though you as um, as as potential buyers really want to make sure that it, it falls somewhere in the middle here um, you want to not allow vendors to come in and just give the same demonstration that they give to everyone else because in reality what's going to happen is that they're always going to look really slick and really impressive and their goal is to ha have everyone fall in love with their with the latest and greatest features and functionality of their product when what you want to avoid in that situation is is 
making sure that your team doesn't fall in love with the, the features and functionality that they don't need. You want to make sure that your core needs are addressed. So what we, one of the kind of things that we see on an ongoing basis is this conflict between the, what I'll call the, the, the sexy types of features versus the non-sexy uh, things that, the, that are truly important to most enterprises. And you know, vendors love to, to come in and sell the sexy stuff, the, usually the things that, that they've just put into production on, in, their, in their latest version of their software. And buyers like that stuff. And so the real danger here is that you spend all the time talking about those types of things when critical to every organization are some of the blocking and tackling, if you will, the, the really the, the core, core workflows, the core processes, the, the audit controls, the, the metadata models that are, that are available to you. And these are the things that bite you in the end if you don't address it in the beginning. So the way you combat that is we, don't, we recommend that you invite vendors to come in and, and demo their, their products, but you don't leave them to their own devices and, and allow them to do their own canned demos. Rather, you, you in advance write some really descriptive use case scenarios that paint a picture of what it is you're trying to do. Now, there's a bit of art and science to this. You want to be descriptive without being overly prescriptive here because you want them, the vendors, to come to the table with the best solution that they think is best for your needs. But here's an example of a scenario that, that we've used in the past where you, you make it as real as possible. Um, you use real type um, personas or, or uh, actors in, in the use case. You use real type environments um, as, as, that, as would exist in your organization. So things like being able to access it via a Mac or a PC or a phone or a tablet or a, uh, some other kind of device out in the field, if you will. You use a, as much real type content uh, or content examples if, if you have it. And you try to describe the future process in a way that that is, is, again, very realistic and um, so that the vendors can un really understand what it is you're trying to do. And from there, you ask the vendors to come in and demo your scenarios. This makes it so much more real to your team and it's much more effective use of time from your perspective. But we've heard from vendors, too, that they very much prefer this type of approach, too, because they get to learn about you and what you're trying to do. Some other key key things here, you know, in addition to demoing your scenarios, of course, make sure that each vendor demos the same scenarios. Make sure they demo them in the same order, if you will, um, from day to day to day, from demo to demo to demo, so that you're comparing apples to apples to apples. It's probably really obvious, but make sure your team is represented. Um, but I've seen many projects go off the rails when an important stakeholder only shows up for two of the four demos, or or one of the four demos, or three of the four demos, um, the, the, it is a, absolutely should be a requirement that everyone on the, on the decision-making team attend all of the demos so that you're able to uh, truly de do, a, do a fair debrief after each one, and then at your, your final selection meeting at the end of the week that you're able to all have the same information that you're, that you're playing with. And then don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. Um, these demo phases are a good, really great opportunity for you to learn about the vendors' uh, technology and the vendors themselves, and particularly around how they're pricing their, their models. You can ask the tough questions about which modules they're, they're uh, including in their proposal, which ones they're not including, and, and this is the time just to start some of those conversations. We'll talk a little bit more about pricing in a few moments. Mistake number three is not getting the full implementation picture uh, at the outset. Um, the example I like to use, and, and I know it's springtime here in New England in the United States, we, my, my wife and I just got a delivery of, of mulch some, looking something like this in our driveway, and then we had to spread it to all of our, our flower beds across the, our yard. And um, I think it's a little bit like when buyers go about buy, uh, procuring technology. Um, what the tool that I needed to spread this around my yard looks something like like this, but in fact, when when buyers of technology, when instead of buying a wheelbarrow for their needs, they often end up with a dump truck. 
And you know, if there's one trend that we see, it's most enterprises overbuy, and as part of that, they really overestimate their own capabilities. So you really will need help in many cases, um, and you need to be honest with what type of help you'll need at really uh, from the outset. That's not to say your in-house teams won't be involved because they, they almost certainly will, but it's all about finding the right blend between your in-house team, your the professional services that the vendor will undoubtedly offer as part of their proposals to you, and in, in, all, in many cases, what help will you need from a third-party integrator? And you know the most successful projects that we see are the ones that get this blend just right. And, it, and to do that, you really need to be honest with the, your own capabilities from the outset. Now, that brings up the question, how much should you rely on an integrator or, and how much should you rely on vendor professional services? Um, now, there are pros and cons to each of, of, those, uh, of those approaches and um, vendors will often try to sell you their professional services first at the, at the expense of, of getting an integrator involved and integrators will come to you and say you don't need the vendor professional services because we can do the whole thing and again there's pros and cons to each but in many cases this is a false choice you know it's not just one or the other um, so what we're actually advising our clients more and more these days is to actually do a combination RFP where you're actually able to test the services from a systems integrator and a vendor's prof professional services at the same time. So in some cases we've gone to, uh, we would advise our clients to go to vendors and say bring your, bring your best systems integrator to the table and come up with a plan for getting your, your technology up and running with a combination of your own professional services and, and the, the systems integrators help. And sometimes we even go directly to a systems integrator and say, "Here's the here's the technology that we've identified. Could you bring? Could you come to the table with a with a blended solution as well?" And this is a good way of of assessing assessing both both um, the parties from both parties at the same time. What I really would recommend that you do not do is go choose a systems integrator first, and then have them help you pick the technology. In that case, you're really going to be limiting yourself. Systems integrators can just realistically only know a handful of technologies, and you're really taking your chances that those hand, that handful of technologies is a good fit for you. So I'd, I'd either like you to do a combination approach or pick a technology first and then go find the right systems integrator. Mistake number four, not properly test driving the solution. So I mentioned those kind of cheerleading fests in, in, the, in a demo construct, construct um, oftentimes it can be really tempting after you see a really solid demo to say, all right, we'll take it. This is, this is the perfect fit for what we're trying to do. Let's, get, let's do it. But in fact, uh, I've seen a lot of people, even when they've done their due diligence during the, during the demos, get surprised down the road if they don't take another uh, another step in the process. And that step that we recommend is to conduct as realistic of a bake-off or a competitive proof of concept as possible. And here what you're trying to do is a couple things. You're really trying to learn about the technology. Um, you're trying to learn about the team that you're that you're going to be working with. And you're trying to just mimic a project as realistically as possible so that you're able to get a real sense of what it's going to be like working with these different parties and the technology. So the way we construct this is usually a minimum of, of a two-week process where you bring your two finalist vendors to the, uh, to the table and say, we're going to take some of those scenarios that we wrote initially and we're going to have you actually build these out uh, for our team. First week will be a, uh, is usually a time where the vendors can can lead you through a build, and then the second week is a chance for your team to actually get to try it. So as realistically as possible, your ingredients, meaning your content is involved, your people actually getting their hands on the technology and trying it out, and um, your processes involved. And again, it, it's, it's, this can be a resource intensive uh, situation, but what's the cost of a failed implementation? And, and I will say, as I always do, the, the most successful selection projects that we've seen have really done their due diligence at this 
competitive proof of concept or bake off phase. So during that, that proof of concept, you're really trying to do a couple things. So you're trying to do some of the, the basics, you know, the, the simple things. You know, you want to understand what it's like to configure users, what it's like to create templates, what it's like to modify workflows. This is, again, this is your first chance for your team to get their hands on this technology and really understand what it's going to be like to work with. But it's also your chance to prove the hard things, those open questions that might still still linger. You know, how is this system go going to integrate with our any legacy systems that we might uh, need it to? And this is a, oftentimes a good chance to prove that out and really actually treat this as a true proof of concept. And again, it's not just about using getting your hands on the technology. It's also your chance to learn about the team. Um, and these are the teams that you're going to be working with, and that's can be as equally as important as, as finding the right product. And the final mistake to avoid is waiting to, too late to negotiate. Um, these types of technology projects um, are always negotiable. Uh, we've seen up to 90% reductions versus actual list prices. You know, that's that's not common, but what is common is some somewhere in the 20 to 20 to 50 percent uh, discount. Some of the smaller deals, though, you know, we, we like to say have, have certainly less room for flexibility, but there's always some room to, to negotiate. However, the problem arises when you wait too late in the process. So what you're seeing on the screen now is is our ideal procurement pr process. We call it RSVP or Real Story Vendor Procurement for short. Uh, it's kind of our our our, our, uh, our again our ideal six phase twenty step process that that every procurement should go through. Now you don't have to spend a ton of time on each of these, but the, again, more the mo more successful projects make sure to address each of these steps at some at some level. But if we get down to the sixth step in this process, the selection, uh, you'll see the first piece there is to make the final supplier decision. Nothing's worse from a negotiation standpoint to go through an entire process like this, a really time and resource intensive process, and then come down to your finalists, really have a leader in the clubhouse that, you that your team really likes, and then start to negotiate. You know, the vendor salespeople are have some vendors have some really strong salespeople on their team, and I can tell you they know what you've invested in into these selection processes, and they will push back and try to take advantage of that. And your bargaining power is drastically reduced if you wait that long. So rather, what we advise our clients to do is to start these these conversations around uh, pricing earlier. So as soon as you get your proposals back from the vendors. Those are the times to start asking questions about pricing. Challenge them on what's included. Challenge them on on their models. You know whether they're based on people or content or um, servers or licenses and, and and that kind of thing. Start to have those conversations and make sure they understand what you need and make sure you understand what they're selling you. And again, at, when they come on site for the demos, that's a per great time to continue that conversation and, and continue to poke holes in their pricing model and make sure you're on the same page. And as you do the proof of concept, don't stop those conversations from happening. Keep that those conversations from happening. Uh, keep those conversations happening throughout. And you just got to understand that ultimately you're working towards a contract, right? You can't divorce this financial piece from the from the rest of the selection. And you know some procurement. Folks will really try to do that for you and take it out of the of the um, of the process. But we we found the most successful negotiations have have started that conversation early and uh, and make it and especially when you make it clear to the vendors that this is a key, key factor in your decision. So to summarize, the five key mistakes are definitely shortlisting the wrong vendors, only viewing the canned demos. Underestimating the full implementation picture, uh, improperly test driving the solution or not test driving the solution at all, and waiting too late to negotiate. So these are our five things that we hope you take to heart when you um, embark on your next technology selection. And with that, I will turn it back over to my colleague Rebecca uh, to wrap things up.
So hopefully for everyone on the phone, um, you found the information helpful, um, especially if you're at the beginning stages of your technology buying journey. So I have one last point that might uh, take about a minute for those of you who can hang on. Um, the process that we've been talking about today at times can be a bit overwhelming, and that's really why we're here. Our research is designed to get you to the right shortlist, as Jared mentioned, as quickly as possible. And our analysts are available to help you every step of the way. So I just wanted to highlight a few key ways that we engage with our customers. So at key points in your decision process, we can serve as your advocate and second opinion on choices, architectures, and especially pricing. Um, we're truly unbiased source, so we can serve as another check and set of eyes on any short list you come up with and offer additional considerations that might be missing. And then finally, we can help you validate any decisions that you make with, with your key stakeholders. So if this sounds beneficial and you'd like more information on our research or how we can help support you, please just enter your email address in the question window, um, or you can also email us at sales at realstorygroup.com. So thanks so much for your time. You guys have a great day.